Good afternoon. This is kindly being introduced by uh, Professor Suzuki. Uh, I am Robert Ward, but I am physically now in Japan, and indeed it is a great honor to be able to, to give an address at uh, the International House. Now, I am more fluent in English compared to my poor Japanese, so let me switch over to English language. Into English. Uh, thank you for that uh, kind introduction, uh, Suzuki Sensei. Um, I'm going to talk about, for about 20 minutes, 25 minutes, uh, on uh, European perspectives on economic uh, security. Um, and this will involve a considerable amount of discussion on Russia's invasion of Ukraine um, and what has happened in the European and others' response since. Um, economic security has been rising as a national priority uh, in many countries. I think there are three main factors which have driven this. Uh, the first is the uh, China-US trade war, which started in 2018, if you remember. This raised awareness of the vulnerability of supply chains, the unpredictability of the great powers, and the associated, fr the associated fragility of the international rules-based system. President Trump's linking of economic and national security in his view of China, which I think was prescient, actually, focused attention on technology in particular. China's President Xi Jinping has also explicitly linked Chinese global technology leadership to the PRC's reaching of great power status by 2049. Techno-nationalism has thus become a new geopolitical and economic security battleground. The second is the COVID-19 pandemic. This has further raised awareness, uh, this has further raised the issue of economic security, showing us that economic security is multifaceted, including, for example, health as an important issue. The pandemic has disrupted supply chains, increased sensitivity around over-reliance on China, and shifted business strategy away from efficiency to resilience. The third is Russia's attack on Ukraine. This is the biggest security crisis in Europe since the end of the Second World War, and as such represents a major structural break in European security. It has also resulted in a major shock to the global economy. We have seen the biggest rise in global oil prices since 1973, the biggest rise in global grain prices since the start of World War I in 1914. Russia has weaponized its commodities leverage from oil to food, as such, the EU is now trying to achieve a 15% cut in gas consumption this winter to mitigate uh, reduced Russian gas flows. German analysts have warned that Germans may have to burn wood this winter to stay warm. The crisis has also shifted geopolitics outside the region of Europe. Witness the strengthening of Gulf regimes as a result of high oil prices. Egypt, Lebanon, Indonesia and other emerging markets, some fragile, face severe challenges because of their dependence on, Euro on Ukrainian wheat, which is unable to reach in international markets now because of Russian blockades. Global, global food security is thus also threatened. The strategic implications of Putin's invasion are also profound. The geopolitical center of gravity of Europe has moved east and north the Black Sea has become an important geopolitical pressure point. As well as an Indo-Pacific strategy, major European powers now find themselves struggling to formulate a Black Sea strategy. We are now having to familiarize ourselves with details of the Montreux Convention. This is also the first crisis in decades in which all sides see core interests at stake. For Putin, any outcome short of subordinating Ukraine may mark a political and psychological defeat. But how can Russia credibly commit to a negotiated settlement given violations of past assurances to Ukraine? For the West, Russian victory would be a recipe for regional instability, undermining the credibility of NATO and the EU. We should remember that four EU nations border Ukraine, Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, and Romania. Ukraine, of course, is fighting for its survival and existence as an independent state. Russia's war against Ukraine has also seen economic statecraft deployed in unprecedented ways. The EU's response has been path-breaking. EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen gets her geopolitical EU 
but probably not in the way that she had imagined. Japan's response has also been strong and principled. Indeed, Tokyo has established itself as a key pillar of the, of the G7 response. Russia thus faces a range of coercive economic measures never inflicted on a major economy before. Examples of these measures are well known but bear repeating. The freezing of its foreign exchange assets, exclusion of some of its banks from the SWIFT network, a ban on semiconductor sales, and so the list goes on. But even before the, its invasion of Ukraine, Russia, as then the world's sixth largest economy, was already the largest country ever to face peacetime sanctions. These were implemented from 2014 after its, after its annexation of Crimea. It's larger even than Italy was when sanctions were imposed on it in 1935, and larger than Japan was uh, when sanctions were imposed on it in 1940. So what is the state of play in this crisis? The new focus on sanctions, I think, is unprecedented, but it also highlights the limits of sanctions as a tool. Sanctions are designed to disrupt trade, to disrupt financial and investment relations, and to impose costs on the sanctioned state. But they cannot be an end in themselves, but rather a means, and one of several means, to achieve political ends. The four main aims of sanctions, again, I think is worth, worth repeating. The first is compellence. So sanctions seek to reverse the unacceptable actions of the target state. The threat of sanctions before a state acts is perhaps more effective than, sanc after, than sanctions after it has, it has acted, however. The second is deterring further unacceptable behavior. The third is effecting regime, regime change. And the fourth is upholding the rules-based order by discouraging others from taking similar action. But the record of sanctions is mixed. One study suggests that just about one third of sanctions implemented between 1914 and 2000 were successful. Sanctions against Iran have been prolonged, but Tehran has developed a siege economy, innovated solutions to some of its, to some of its economic blockages. Sanctions against Iraq in the 1990s cost thousands of lives and probably damaged permanently the country's economic and social fabric. We also need to distinguish between efficacy and effect in determining whether sanctions work. These are not the same thing. Also important, I think, and, and sometimes undiscussed, sanctioning countries implicitly assume rational economic behavior on behalf of the target and its people. But this in ignores the irrationality of politics and humans. Witness Dostoevsky's underground man, who says, twice two is four is nevertheless an intolerable thing. Twice two is five can sometimes be a most charming little thing as well. Underground man being a template, I think, an exemplar for how modern politics has evolved. The impact of sanctions on the Russian economy has been severe. A 10% decline in GDP this year, which will wipe out perhaps a decade or more of Russia's economic performance. There will probably be another small contraction in 2023. I see some houses are saying around 2%, and then slow growth afterwards. As a result, the state, the Russian state, as a result of this crisis, the Russian state has been expanding further its role in the Russian economy which will in turn add further, straight, further constraints to growth. Even before the invasion of, of, of Ukraine, Russian, the Russian government owned about 70% of the economy, so a very high proportion. Exports to Russia are falling, even from countries that are not sanctioning, even from China, which interestingly is exercising restraint in terms of how it deals with Russia out of fear of, of infringing US sanctions. But exports from Russia to China are doing quite well, mainly, of course, oil and gas. Russia may have recovered from its initial shock. This reflects uh, quick action by the Russian central bank, which has boosted the ruble, um, continued influx of petrodollars, even though it's because its foreign, foreign exchange reserves are frozen, it can't sterilize these, pushing up the value of the ruble. But ruble strength is not a sign of health, given the unusualness of the context. But this short-term stabilization does not change the longer-term picture, 
and the damage to Russia's growth model from the sanctions. Russia will, for example, probably ultimately lose its key markets for oil and gas in Europe. China is also not a direct substitute in terms of size. New pipelines to China need to be constructed to take gas to China. China is also strategically reluctant to become dependent on single suppliers. Russia will also feel increasingly the strains of being financially and technologically decoupled from the West. The lack of access to advanced technology will be particularly challenging. But also further down the value-added uh, value ladder, shortages are becoming evident. For example, the inability to access chemicals to make paper white. Beige paper is now more common in Russia, a reminder of the old Soviet era. I'd like to conclude my talk by considering where we go from here. I'd like to make three main points. Russia's response to the sanctions and its ability to stabilize in the short term show the limits to what sanctions can achieve in the short term or against a military invasion. Sanctions are also vulnerable to the end game. When are they lifted, for example? It, after a ceasefire that ultimately may benefit Russia by allowing it to regroup, or after Russia is defeated, whatever defeat may mean. The Russia sanctions will also have important implications beyond Ukraine, for example, in Asia, a point that Prime Minister Kishida has repeatedly made. Uh, Ukraine today uh, could be East Asia tomorrow. One big question that arises from Russia's attack on Ukraine, however, is how to use economic and other deterrents more effectively. If sanctions fail to deter Russia from invading Ukraine, how do we deter China in the case of a, of a Taiwan contingency? Beijing presents a far bigger challenge than, Ru than Russia on many levels, not, not least because it is far larger and embedded in the, global, in, a, in the global economy on multiple levels. One challenge for policymakers will be how to design a proactive sanctions policy that gives the West first mover advantage instead of reacting to the target's hostile actions. Also, effective economic statecraft starts from domestic resilience. Thus, how to ensure that the sanctions that are most needed for achieving an objective don't hurt the sanctioner more. The issue of reparations and reconstruction is also an issue that will come increasingly to the, floor, to the fore as this crisis continues. Do we use Russian sovereign assets for Ukrainian reconstruction? The, the moral case for doing so is obviously strong. Why should other countries forego aid because it, is, because it is being used to rebuild after Putin's war? But the legal issues around confiscating sovereign assets, of course, are complicated. This is not a simple issue. The second point is one result of the crisis, I think, will be a far closer Russia-China strategic relationship. This strategic relationship has been deepening for a while. In Japan, you know this very well. You can see this, uh, this, you can see this relationship being operationalized. Witness the joint air patrol over sensitive waters between Japan and South Korea in 2020 and 2021, the joint naval uh, patrol around Japan in 2021. But it accelerated in 2022. For example, Xi Jinping's blank no limits check to Putin ahead of the Winter Olympics this year, which of course he cashed on February the 24th. This relationship is strategically and operationally very important. China and Russia are the two challenger states with the greatest desire and potential to contest the West's systems of alliances and partnerships. This type of relationship is also new for China. Beijing considered alliances a Western construct directed against the China, against China and the socialist world. Hitherto, China had sought to develop an informal, non-aligned alliance system that would protect China's interests, for example, in the Belt and Road Initiative. Beijing has generally sought to avoid the Westphalian Western concept of equality between sovereign states. Russia, meanwhile, as one of my colleagues has said, finds itself geopolitically lonely. A Kremlin advisor has said, 
We are our own allies. But this also reflects Russia's conceptualization of itself as a great power. For Russia, international relations are dominated by assertions of its great power interests. The USSR, Eastern Europe, fraternal states were satellites, not allies. Russia's relationships are transactional and not based on trust, which is a glue of Western alliances. This history makes this, this, history makes this relationship interesting on many levels. Russia-China ties are now arguably the strongest since the brief uh, ideological alliance in the 1950s. Although the two countries' interests clash frequently, Russia, for example, thrives on instability. China doesn't. Look at the Middle East for evidence of that. Regime interests are aligned. Russia is key to China's geopolitical aims and a key potential supplier of energy and food. China is key, of course, to Russia breaking free from its isolation ultimately. Japan's northern flank has thus become far more vulnerable. And I'll leave you with my final point on counter-Western economic statecraft, which I think will move to the fore as a result of this crisis. Such has been the unprecedented nature of the G7's and others' responses to, China, to Russia's invasion of Ukraine that we should assume that A, this has shocked Beijing and others, and that B, that this accelerates thinking already underway to counter Western economic statecraft. Growing Iran-Russia cooperation is one example of this. Bilateral uh, tensions exist between Moscow and Tehran, but the two have worked well uh, together in Syria and have learned a lot about each other. It seems that there is some coordination happening to evade U.S. sanctions, with Iranians teaching Russians how to cope with the U.S. financial and trade sanctions. Russia and Iran have also pledged to expand cooperation to use national currencies uh, in trade. Russia has also, uh, Iran has also floated barter arrangements, Russian metals, for example, for Iranian car parts. Iran has also joined the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, SCO, or this is, it, although this is probably more a matter of prestige than practice at the moment. Moves to circumvent the dominance of the US dollar will also become more intense. Russia has also been trying to reduce its vulnerability to Western economic sanctions, notably by reducing US, US dollar reliance in trade, building or trying to build an alternative to SWIFT and reducing holdings of US treasuries. There is no risk, in my view, to the US dollar in the short term. There are too many structural issues preventing the renminbi, China's currency, taking over. These include capital controls, uh, China's shallow capital markets, um, also the lack of independence of the Chinese central bank. And also for the renminbi to be used more, more frequently, more globally, two countries that are not China also need to use its currency. The pool of willing participants at the moment is still too shallow. But the experience of Russia will accelerate efforts in Beijing and elsewhere to bypass Western financial dominance. Look, for example, at the development of central bank digital currencies, CBDCs. These need to be circulating domestically first and have a good domestic base. And China is working on this, but progress has been slow so far. But it is linking up with other countries and it is driving ahead uh, with this experiment. I think it needs to be watched. Look at, see also China's cross-border interbank payment system, CIPS. This is also worth watching. China's deployment of its BRI networks, Belt and Road Initiative networks, are also in theory, of, uh, are also in theory a means of amplifying its push to challenge U US financial dominance. Russia's invasion of Ukraine may therefore have accelerated this structural shift and have very, very long-term implications going forward. With that, I will end my speech. Um, thank you for listening and pass back to Suzuki Sensei. Thank you very much. From here, I will be speaking in English. And to the keynote speech that was delivered just now, I would like to delve down deeper with questions. Well, thank you very much, uh, Robert. Um, it was a very comprehensive, uh, very thorough analysis, and I think it was also giving the uh, very, uh, uh, 
a, a quite different perspective from, uh, from a Japanese one. Uh, um, I, I think there, there's a lot of things that I, I, I agree with, and, I, and th there's always a problem that if you agree more, then it it's really make, a, uh, make it difficult to, uh, to question you. <laughs> and nevertheless, I think uh, uh, the main theme of, the, uh, of the, this discussion is going to be the impact of the sanctions on Russia. And uh, one of the problem is that uh, when you are sanctioning the size of the Russian economy, you also have the dependency on the Russian, uh, Russian economy, particularly the natural resources. And uh, given the uh, possible uh, uh, future scenario of the conflict with China, then there may, may be much more serious issue with regard to the trap of interdependence. And the, China has already exercised the uh, use of this uh, or weaponization of the supply chains and uh, blocking uh, its imports from the market. Um, so um, one, uh, the first question I'd like to ask you is that what is the uh, economies which are interdependent and imposing a sanction? What is the, uh, the means that you can take to avoid such a uh, trap of interdependence? So in case of Europe, what should have done and what can be done? Uh, of today and what will be done in the future? Well, that's an excellent question, Suzuki Sensei, because um, it goes to the heart of some of the problems that Europe has had uh, uh, in trying to deal with, um, uh, with, with the after effects of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. On, uh, before I get to that, on China, um, I think that China's deployment of economic coercion has been less successful. Um, than many thought it would be. For example, Australia, which has been fortunate in some respects, but certainly has found uh, other markets for some of its uh, products. Um, interdependence uh, is, uh, symmetric interdependence, um, is not a good tool for economic coercion. And um, the EU has found uh, this uh, with the Russia uh, relationship with Russian gas. And... Um, the EU was reluctant to stop Russian gas imports because it would hurt the EU more in the long term, even though it hurts Russia more, uh, in the short term rather, even though it hurts Russia more um, in the long term. So to avoid this, um, asymmetrical interdependence uh, is uh, important. Um, and this, uh, you get this in the EU, for example, again, when critical nodes are under EU control, such as SWIFT uh, or the insurance ban uh, on Russian tankers, for example. Ultimately, um, Europe needs to decouple itself from fossil fuel uh, dependence on Russia. I see no way uh, around this. Um, even once, um, hopefully, uh, this crisis is resolved, um, although who knows when that may be, I suspect trust uh, in Russia's predictability uh, is completely gone now. So ultimately, uh, the EU does need to decouple itself um, from Russian uh, fossil fuels. Uh, Russia's dependencies on Europe are multiple, uh, ranging from tech to services. R Europe's dependence on Russia is one-dimensional, that is fossil fuels. So um, Europe does have a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, sort of tools in its box, um, and I suspect that uh, the gas issue will, uh, will really be quite uh, intense uh, as the winter approaches. Right. Well, I, I think this is uh, this reminds me the case of when China has banned the export of the rare earth mineral to Japan in 2010, and that was when the uh, Japanese automakers we uh, suffered from uh, not having an access to the Chinese uh, rare earth mineral, which are about 90% of imports depends on China. Uh, but eventually, in uh, five years later the Japanese car manufacturers invented the way to avoid using the rare earth mineral and to, uh, to build the hybrid cars. So that sort of, um, you know, to, to, uh, to avoid 
the uh, over-dependency on, on certain uh, material, particularly the raw, um, raw material like uh, natural gas, oil, or rare earth mineral, is, uh, is extremely important, and the technology is partially the solution. And I think in the case of Russia, I think this also be true to, uh, to, uh, to revolutionize the economy into more greener and more less dependent on the fossil fuel. But of course, it's, it doesn't come immediately. So there, there has been a sort of a short-term, long-term problem. But uh, nevertheless, um, I, I think this is, um, uh, this is one solution that we, we shall look into it. The, just as, a, as if I may, just on, on China and rare earths, of course, sure. China controls uh, production, but it doesn't control global supply. So rare earths are elsewhere in the world, apart from in China, in the US, Australia, other places. Uh, obviously, they're environmentally quite difficult, uh, quite degrading. But uh, again, I think the, the, China, the experience of economic coercion uh, from China has been quite instructive, that even though China is enormous, um, when it tries to... Um, coerce other countries, it, it isn't always successful. Um, and I think Beijing should learn some, uh, perhaps learn some lessons from that, as, as we should as well. Right. Um, what is very interesting is that uh, if China tried to ban, let's say, the coal from, uh, from Australia, then China will suffer as well. You know, China will face the shortage of coal. So they have to buy from somewhere else, like uh, Indonesia. And then those people who are buying from the Indonesia is now buying from the Australia. So at the end of the day, when you try to use this coercion, but at the end of the day, what happened is just a you know, change of the supplier's receiver's relationship, and uh, it doesn't really have uh, any effect. Uh, so uh, Australia w will not suffer. And I think that sort of a wider perspective, macro perspective, is important when we talk about the Chinese economic coercion. Yes, it's an exercise of the political enforcement, you know, the political will and political power, again, you know, in using the economic tools, but economic tools has the sort of a, a different consequences in the market. And I think we need, what we need to, uh, to, to look at in, in the geoeconomics term is to, to see that it's not just the one incident that the China banned Australian coal, but that we need to see the, you know, what happened in the entire global market. Can I just uh, make another, because you raised a point about the green transition, right. which I think is absolutely right. And uh, I certainly think in the UK, um, I'm seeing more electric EVs, electric vehicles uh, on, the, on the roads, and more people are discussing how to get solar panels uh, and, and so on. So I certainly think this, combined with, with, with one or two other um, issues, is accelerating that green transition. Uh, Putin, however, is betting the, on the fact that this transition is a sort of perhaps overblown or will take a very long time, um, as are some countries in the Gulf uh, as well. So there is a bit of a standoff, sort of strategic standoff here, um, that depends on assumptions of how quickly this green transition will appear. Uh, but I suspect that it will be, uh, be faster now than it would have been otherwise. I agree. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, this Russian... Um, Russian weaponizing gas is actually accelerating the green transition and, uh, you know, there, there is an immediate need for people to invest in the green, uh, green technology and transforming its energy, uh, energy structure. It's not about the long-term consequences of the global warming, it's about the dependency. Of, of the fossil fuel in other countries. So I think that that makes a, a perfect sense to, to accelerate into this, uh, uh, this dynamics. And I think uh, uh, I, it is also true for Japan that you know, we are facing with the, uh, uh, a big problem of the Russian so-called nationalization of the Saharin II. And uh, that is also a, a, a warning shot to, uh, to warn us that if we keep on depending on the Russian oil and gas, then, uh, and, and in that context, uh, if we depend on the, the, middle e the oil from the Middle East, th that will also you know, increase the vulnerability of our economy. So the, um, the one more question I'd like to ask you is the, uh, the 
the hottest thing on, on the earth is the semiconductor industry. Um, the, J Japan has invited the, the factory of TSMC to, uh, to Kumamoto and uh, uh, and the uh, United States is in, uh, has invited the uh, uh, TSMC in Arizona, the Samsung in uh, in Texas. What about Europe? Europe is now plan. You know, the EU is planning to do the uh, the European Chip Act, and uh, and in my understanding, EU is not the kind of uh, government to to give subsidies to for industrial policy. And I think I've never seen any uh, case that the Europe, EU is spending money for, uh, for such uh, uh, invitation. But now they are doing. And, uh, and of course, the Britain is out of EU now. But uh, I think uh, it is also a very important concern for, the, uh, for Britain as well. So what is the, your view on the European and the British uh, position on this uh, competition of the semiconductor industry? Well, first on uh, TSMC uh, in Japan. I know that area of Japan very well. My, my father-in-law, he lives uh, in uh, Kikuyo, uh, uh, Tsukure. Um, and uh, I read an article in the Nikkei newspaper said this region is just famous for carrots. Well, that's not true because it has pharmaceuticals. There's quite a lot of industry down there, as I know, because I've walked the area. Um, and it very, it'll be a very interesting um, experiment uh, for TSMC. Can they attract sufficient uh, talent? Um, all, all sorts of issues there, which I'll be watching very, uh, very closely, given Japan's uh, demographic issues. Um, the... Uh, the EU's plans, um, they focus quite a lot on uh, sort of ring fencing the EU, um, building sort of an autonomous capability. Um, I th I'm skeptical that they actually have the, uh, the money um, to actually do it. Uh, clearly, they, they recognize that semiconductors are really important um, and they want to do something about it. But I, th and I look at their ambitions and I forget the actual targets, but I think actually they are quite difficult targets uh, to achieve. Um, and partly because, of course, it will need someone to pay for it. Um, I think that is also, so again, looking at the semiconductor industry, um, thinking about economic security and thinking about the economic security law that is now, um, uh, that was passed the, the other day uh, here. Um, this does redefine relations with business, between government and business. Um, and I think in Japan, again, you're, you're conducting a great experiment here in, uh, in terms of economic security. And the, the ministries are all trying to operationalize this law now. Um, so I think that will be interesting how business and businesses cope with all the bureaucracy that will inevitably sort of come, uh, come down. But there's one is the redefining of uh, relations with business and government. And the second, I think, um, and again, you see this uh, within the EU and you see it in, in Japan as well, um, sort of how the government uh, considers financial risk particularly with investing in these emerging technologies. Because these, I mean, semiconductors are like a sort of bottomless pit of cash. You can invest sort of tens of billions, um, and perhaps you get it right, and perhaps you don't get it right. Um, so is the government, doesn't the, do, do, do the governments really understand uh, what they're doing? Um, uh, and do they have the appetite to take the risk to perhaps lose money in the interests of what may be um, economic um, security. The UK is in a sort of slightly different position because you say it's, it's left um, uh, the EU. Um, it's not big enough to have uh, sort of autonomy. Um, but I think it's sort of you may see um, sort of shades of uh, the UK using its uh, industrial strengths uh, in high technology uh, just to keep links with various producers and so on. Um, but it will need to, the UK will need to be flexible here in a world where that is breaking down into big trade blocks. Uh, you've got EU, you've got uh, CPTPP, you've got NAFTA and so on. And the, the UK obviously is sort of floating around at the moment uh, on its own, potentially joining the CPTPP soon, one hopes. Um, but uh, the UK's... Uh, position, I think, will we'll we'll need quite a lot of flexibility. Right. Well, I, I think you mentioned this uh, CPTPP, and I, I think one of the major aspects of the uh, current uh, Indo-Pacific um, strategy in Japan is to have this, uh, yeah, to establish this more secure supply chain network. And I think this is part of this uh, economic security issue and, 
and through the uh, friends and allies in the uh, the free trade agreement like CPTPP, and uh, Japan wish the um, United States to come in, and we are going to have this economic two plus two and the, by the end of the month. Um, so I, I think this sort of, a, you know, uh, how to build up the international coalition on the uh, on the supply chain and the semiconductor is the perhaps the the, the key issue. Meanwhile, um, as you said, it's a bottomless bottomless pit. You know, it's it costs tr trillion of yens, and it's it's a, a, almost impossible to maintain the government to intervene all the time. So I think there will be a, 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 a some sort of a, 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 a sanguine uh, uh, policy to uh, to make sure that you know what you know you know what to do and uh, you you expect what you uh, what you get from the, these investment and i think it is uh, uh, the more more importantly this is about the, the competition with china um, i think the the semiconductor industry is uh, to some extent uh, is Still, uh, uh, you know, a superior to the Chinese industry, so that the Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, and the United States trying to to maintain the some sort of a surplus or the superiority against China to make to put China down for a while and uh, brings you know uh, put speed us up to uh, to have more better uh, technology. 